Anyway, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, tonight, uh, we will talk about the specific changes uh, made by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Again, this was the legislation that was uh, in December of uh, 2017, uh, generally effective from January 1st, 2018, and uh, has uh, uh, it has left most of what already exists in place, the subpart F, transfer pricing rules, all sorts of things have been left in place, and it layers new things on top. So in a sense, this year in comparison with the uh, uh, pre, uh, this course in pre-Tax Cuts and Jobs Act years, you have a lot more uh, to cover in the course and to study on. Now, in terms of our agenda, again, we'll attempt to talk about uh, the objectives a little bit, and then we'll attempt to go into a little bit of the mechanics of it. Uh, for the real details, you seriously need to look at the code and now for some of these uh, either proposed, uh, well, uh, for some of these proposed regulations which have been uh, issued over the past year. Now, I put up here referring to, uh, you know, Congress's perspective. What were they trying to do? And what they were trying to do was at least what I'm calling an, an impossible balancing act. They had all sorts of factual situations that they look at in terms of what's been happening over the past couple of decades to corporate tax revenues. Uh, they also had uh, a lot of companies complaining about not being competitive. Uh, they had budgetary issues, so lots of things. Now, the first one that I put up here was respond to complaints from large multinationals that the U.S. tax system made them uncompetitive vis-a-vis -vis their foreign competitors. Okay, so this is the question that I think we raised in one of the prior sessions of is a multinational from the United States that is trying to, let's say, secure a contract making a bid for a con you know for some job in uh, Brazil are they in a similar position or a less competitive position than say a uh, multinational from Germany or from Japan or from some other country so there was a lot of complaints that the high US tax rate of 35% which of course only would kick in when uh, profits were distributed back in the way of dividends to the United States. Again, that was our deferral system. Many multinationals would complain that we have this terribly uncompetitive system. There should not be any US tax on earnings, real business earnings from outside the United States. Uh, that was one thing uh, that was affecting Congress. They hear this, it's something they can understand. Gee, we're not being competitive. Now, is this competition the only, let's say, competition that Congress should worry about? Is there another type of competition? So, for example, let's say we have this, uh, let's say we have a U.S. company uh, that manufactures products and sells them, and it both manufactures in the U.S. and also has manufacturing locations outside the United States. And compare them to a smaller U.S. company that manufactures the same products and sells the same products, but they only manufacture in the United States. They don't have an overseas facility. They don't have overseas sales offices. There are really two types of competition. One is that U.S. multinational vis-a-vis -a, -vis a multinational from France or Germany or Japan. 
but there's also competition of a U.S. multinational vis-a-vis a company in, uh, uh, in Seattle that only has activities in Seattle but is doing the same type of business. Now, Congress essentially ignored the second kind. They only focused on the first kind. So that's one of the pressures that, that Congress had. Now, a second thing, you've heard me mention a number of times that because companies, because multinationals didn't want to bring money back that would be immediately taxed at 35%, they stockpiled uh, for you know, various companies billions and billions of dollars totaling uh, several trillion dollars uh, outside the United States. So Congress was looking at this and saying, gee, we want to encourage companies to bring back this money because it will create jobs. So that was one of the factors here. Another one was to recognize that to create a system which does not tax overseas earnings creates a huge incentive to actually move operations and profits outside of the United States to other countries. So they had this pressure, well, we don't want to be encouraging this, but we obviously are, so what do we do? Well, we, with what we gave, we now take back some. And this is primarily the guilty rules that I've been referring to and that we'll talk about more later. Uh, so we'll take some of it back. Not all of it, but some of it back. So we end up with, uh, with this new system which has these, these different objectives in mind, but they're not, uh, let's just say that it has created something very, very complicated there's logic as to why it's there, but it's not something that uh, uh, I think uh, in retrospect you look back and say, gee, this was really the best they could do. And uh, noting, noting the bottom part of the slide, uh, all these things are an extra layer. All of the other rules that already existed are still there. Literally, as a class, you know, you uh, as students have more to learn than, uh, than students in this class uh, two years ago. Uh, will this new system be effective? Uh, we'll try to talk uh, a little more about that uh, later on, but uh, really only time will tell. Uh, the uh, initial uh, prognostication is not, uh, not so high. Okay, this we talked about before, that was the, uh, uh, that only a limited amount of money has come back uh, to, uh, to the U.S. Okay, so now let's uh, give a simple illustration of, uh, of what's happening now. Uh, we assume a U.S. corporate shareholder, uh, not, uh, not an individual, uh, at least for this discussion, uh, U.S. corporate shareholder, uh, it has, of course, some number of U.S. subsidiaries, and it has a CFC, which is performing some manufacturing or service business. And we will assume for simplicity that that CFC uh, has zero foreign tax. Remember that the U.S. corporate shareholder and U.S. subs will typically elect to file a consolidated return. So in a way, there's a, a circle that encompasses the U.S. shareholder and the U.S. subsidiaries that are conducting business. They're all generally subject to tax at, uh, at 21%. But Congress, looking at this, said, well, as part of this effort to discourage multinationals from, again, moving 
intangibles overseas, doing profit shifting and so on. We ought to give some benefit to those companies that leave those activities within the United States. So this is where FDII comes in. We'll see a little bit as to what that stands for and how it's calculated. But essentially, they're saying to the extent that you sell US manufactured products to foreign buyers, you know, that it's, and it's exported, we will give you a lower effective tax rate on most of those earnings or some portion of those earnings. And that effective tax rate is this 13.125. Then we look at the foreign side and we see that to the extent that there is income within the CFC, there's, again, under these guilty rules, current US taxation at the shareholder level at 10.5%. So at least on the surface, you can see that there's a benefit to moving profits still into the CFC because the amount of US tax currently imposed is a 10 and a half versus the same activity in the US company of 13.125. Now, interestingly, uh, this FDII uh, item might, in fact, have to go away at some point and that 13.125 would be replaced by 21%. Why? Because there's some international rules under the World Trade Organization, uh, former GATT uh, General Agreement uh, on uh, Tariffs and Trade. There are rules which say what are legal export subsidies and what are illegal export subsidies. So. There have been numerous articles and complaints that, uh, from other countries that perhaps this FDII regime is not legal under World Trade Organization rules. And if eventually that occurs, this could end up going away. 